Welcome to the Stoppage Time Penalty Show. Today's guest, content creator extraordinaire, Michael Brown. How are you doing, sir? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm good. Tired, but you know what? We just keep things moving. Listen, if you ain't if you ain't tired, you ain't grinding, man. If you had to describe yourself as a colour, what would it be and why? A colour? Um, I don't know. I, 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 I just take red. It's a, it's a it's a fiery colour. Um, I think that's probably the best way to describe myself is I'm not everyone's cup of tea. Um, I have my own opinions. I stick to them. Whether I'm right or wrong, um, you know, I obviously learn more from when I'm wrong. But um, it takes me a long time to, to discover that I am. But yeah, I would probably say red because it's just, it's just a fiery colour. And that's the type of person I am. I'm very, very forward thinking. Um, I love to learn, but also as well, I'm very set in my ways. So if I see something wrong, I try to point it out quickly and I don't come across. I think that's the main thing I always get told as well. Is I don't come across um, really nice, but I'm always trying to be nice. But I guess I'm just headstrong. So you mentioned about red being your favourite colour. Is that a reflection of your football journey because you were part of Charlton's Academy? Uh, to be honest, when I was really young, I think I was in Charlton until I was really young and then we say like 10, 11 and then I stopped. Um, but I'm a West Ham fan, so Claret is probably my colour. But um, yeah, uh, I was there till I was like 10, 11, 12, didn't like it anymore. Didn't fall out. I love football. She wanted to play football with my mates. And then... Um, so I would never say, oh, like, oh, 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 I could have been a pro or anything. I, I definitely couldn't have been a pro. I was nowhere near anything like that. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think the reflection of that isn't the colour I am. I'm, I'm Karen Blue. Like, um, if, you, if, you, if you cut me open, I'm definitely Karen Blue. What was your first football in memory? Oh, my first football in memory? Uh, I, used to live in, I used to live in New Cross. So I used to live behind the den. So I used to live in like um like a square of houses. Um my first one remember is going out on the street and just playing football with my, my mates in like the so there's only ever like one entrance in and one entrance out. I remember it so well when we used to play knockouts. And I always used to get like would be like a goal hanger and like get the first few goals. But I remember my first ever time, I think it's the most vivid thing, is like the first time I ever won. So I used to have like, oh, I remember going out and playing and stuff, like the odd bits, but I think the thing that's the, like, the first ever time I won. And I think like, that's my, that's my, that's my first ever big football memory for me, is just going out and playing with my mates uh, in, in the middle of the square and um, just knocking the ball about. And, and it was one of those old school balls as well that was like white and it had all the little bits missing. So you could tell <laughs> it played on the tarmac. Everyone's everyone is this, and if you don't, if you're not a '90s kid, you don't know what that ball is. Jesus, yeah, so that's a massive ball, you know. Do you think there's too much pressure on kids going into the academy system? Uh, yes and yes and no. Um, depends on the parent, doesn't it? Like, um, a good friend of mine, Carl Davy, um, his son, his son is um getting offers from clubs. I think he's I think he's made the choice of what club he's going to. I don't wanna don't wanna say that out loud though, just in case they change their mind. But um, you know, it depends on the parent, doesn't it? Like as well, academies have the ma it depends on the club as well. Like they have a massive turnaround to try and get players through to their first teams. Um and then there's pressures on kids. Also a lot of kids fall through the cracks. Um or they get sold a dream and then they don't develop in the right manner. So, yeah, I think there's a massive pressure. And there's also pressure on the coaches to perform as well because, again, it's a, it's a results-driven it's a results -driven business, isn't it, football? Um, no matter where you look at it, it's um, it's results-driven business. Even in the, in, the, in the academies, how many of our, how many of our kids are going to make it into the next, the next year when you look at a kid? How are, gonna, how are they going to develop? You don't know as well. You don't know with a lot of kids how they're going to develop physically. So like one kid could be really, really small, gets to 13, 14, they get let go, and then they get a growth spurt, and then they are the player they wanted them to be. So yeah, there's, it's, it's a gamble, isn't it, a lot of the time? A lot of kids fall through the cracks. Um, so yeah, I would, I would say there's it's a lot of pressure on people to perform. And it also it depends at the level and club that you're at. Um, it depends on the category, doesn't it? Like So if you're a cat one, or a cat three or, 
you know, it does depend. I mean, I was really lucky recently to um, to meet Dylan Gavin, who is at Charlton, um, and he was at Welling, and I was doing. I spent a lot of time with him, and he was saying, you know, there is a lot of pressure there. And you get a lot of, especially when you get to his age, which is under twenty one. It's massive. So it's, it's a massive thing, um, and that's when you start. You know, are you going to be a pro? You know, if you're not going to be a pro, or again, you might not fit that club system. Do you know what I mean? Like that system they or the club might change owner or change manager and then their philosophies change so yeah a, there's so much pressure and, and so many little things so many i, I have a, i have a saying like life is one percent and I, all the one percent add up like and i think that's what it sort of comes to as well so all the one percent in football there's so much pressure on it but if one percent doesn't go your way then another one percent falls somewhere else it's hard it's hard do you think parents sometimes live their dreams through their kids? If I take my time back to maybe three or four years ago when I was at um, Charlton Under-21 Women, there's a few parents there who would make moves for their kids based on themselves. Like, again, I don't want to name names. Um, I don't want to name clubs. Um, but there's maybe I remember one parent in particular that was like, oh, my, my daughter's getting offered here. And then the obviously the manager would be Cole. Um, but the manager at the time would be like, look, your your best your best chance really is to stay here. Don't get sold the dream. And the player, the player was sold the dream. And event um really good player, still playing, great player, but she hasn't hit the heights she was told. And the parent was sold the dream of your, your daughter's going to be in two or three years. She's going to be here, here, here. She's already, and the player had already made like one appearance for child and women. Sometimes parents need to wind that in a little bit. And it's harder with boys as well, isn't it? Because with boys, it's such a moneymaker. You look at some of the kids that go into academies now and they're getting offered like houses straight away. Oh, we're going to move your kid up to, or down here or up there um, during the summer. Um, uh, I know, I know of a player who was going around clubs and eventually Spurs got with, like he went, he went to, to name some of the clubs, um, you know, like Derby and other places, but uh, Spurs got involved. Spurs top, top club, Premier League club. They was like, Oh, um, would he be willing to stay with his parents and travel X, Y, Z every day? But then, then the parent became dis you know, disheartened about it. Or you can go for the reverse where parents are, are sold, again, sold the dream, given the house, given everything. And then when it doesn't work out, what happens then? I've never heard that. I've heard of some of those stories, but I've never seen them. But you get those, yeah, parents, parents are massive as well. You know, you've got to look after your child's interest. Sometimes you've got to look after yourself as well. I've, I've, I, I, I've never been in that. I've got, I've got kids myself. and. You know, none of my kids have, have gone on to, to be footballers or anything. Uh, my little girls, nah. But um, I hear stories of it. And unless you come from a background where your family are probably ex-pros, then, thingy, uh, I, I, um, again, I know a, a couple of ex-pros who one of their sons is now at Welling. And he gives his son the biggest support ever. So he's the flip side of it. He's the flip side of it. And he's, he's an ex-pro. But he also knows how hard it is, and he also knows how parents can be like that. So it depends on the parent as well. How how um, your footballing IQ is for the social side of things, or the or the material side of things. That's where that's where it comes down to. What what type of parent are you? I could have mentioned at the beginning of our conversation uh, that I that I believe that you're a social media icon. You know, I know that you'll play it down. Not me, mate. Uh, but you know, um, you, you know, you're a you're a triple threat. You know, you can know how to edit, produce, take photos, film. Um, you know all aspects of um, the whole production side of of just media in general. I mean, when was the first time you you literally dabbled in? Um, in that, that side of the game, I'm a jack of all trades, really. 
um, master of none. Um, so I do coaching as well. So I do I do everything. Um, but yeah, I was at I was at Well in Town um, with Kevin Oakes, and um, I was just sort of being like the runaround guy, I guess. Like I was doing bits and bobs, coaching, whatever. And then one day, um, he just turned around. I was like, oh, I need someone to take photos. So it was um, my kid's mum at the time. My her sister was a or is a photographer, or doing it at college. So I rang her. Said, "Oh, is there any way you could come down, do me a favour?" And um, she just said, "Oh, look, just take my camera." And then that was it. Like that was sort of like the bug for media, I guess. I took the camera, I took photos on the day. I was like, "Oh, this this is alright," you know. Yeah, it was it was a nice sunny day, so the lighting was perfect. Um, yeah, and I guess I went from there. I started learning photography. And then when lockdown came along, I started learning media. I actually rewind that a little bit. I joined Metro Gas. Um, and I wanted to give a massive shout out to the owner of Metro Gas, Tim. Tim Morgan, one of the best people I've ever, 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 ever met in football. And I think I touched with him recently. And I told him that again, like, I've got so much time for Metro Gas because of Tim. Anything to do with Metro Gas. Like, it was on the end of my road as well. But Tim is one of the best guys. And um, when we got there, there was no media. And he said, look, like, you want to learn here's your you know i'll give you all the support there's no money involved i if you had to do a lot of things of my own back like buy gopros camera um everything for me is like self-taught as well so at the beginning things weren't weren't great i think i was watching some of them back and i was i've been showing someone recently about all the stuff that you can now do so i guess i i, I have shown people or shown someone how to work things recently but um yeah i picked up picked it up and then at metro gas we got a vo which I don't, I don't, I don't praise highly VO, but it's a good tool. It's a good coaching tool. But yeah, we've got a VO in, so learn how to learn how to edit, um, edit highlights. How do how do we do it? Then I started learning interviews. Still doing photos. Kept my coaching going in the women's game. Um, and then the lockdown came along, and then when lockdown came along, I started doing like mini interviews with some of my friends. And then some people that I've always wanted to just speak to and learn their learn their stories, and they're they're still on YouTube now. Um, and there's some really good stories out there. Um, and I met some great people as well. And then during lockdown, I got to know a guy named Joe Doherty, who is uh, was a goalkeeper at Cray Valley, really good guy. And then I started spending a lot of my time at Cray Valley. Um, and then uh, you know, like obviously, I went from there to. Cray Valley eventually offering me offering me a job. Um, I didn't I actually turned it down first um, because I didn't feel I was ready. And then come the end of the season came and they spoke to me again, and I felt I was ready. And then went and got a capture mast, things like filming and stuff that started coming involved. Um, capture mast is basically the company that sell the pole with a Sony uh, Sony HD camera that goes on top. Someone does the filming, and then. You can take it anywhere, so you don't need a gantry. And it's it's the sort of stuff that uh, your instant replay use and, um, you know, people like that. Um, and then, yeah, it's just been going from there and there. And then the, the summer came and we I was talking to Craig Valley about coming back, started my next, my next level of coaching. And the guy who was running my, running my court, well, running was my teacher, Turned around and he said, Oh, you still do media? I said, Yeah. And then um put me in touch with where I am now at Welling United. And um yeah, went went in there in the summer as head of media. Um, really enjoyed it, learned so much so quickly. And then it didn't go bad or anything at Welling. Um Ollie Groom became available, which I'm sure he'll he'll happily like say. Um he obviously left Charlton after 10 years. And um, he became head of media, but Welling didn't throw me to the side or anything. Really, really thankful to the gaffer as well. Um, he brought me in and he said, look, like you still do all these jobs. So I still do on a match day, I still do photography. But now I set up the warm up. Uh, I'm involved during the week in the coaching or, you know, I'm out there helping out. Um, still all the equipment is mine and things like that. And obviously now I do analysis. Welling as well, so it was another like another tool to pick up. 
Um, and I went and got a company to give us the, the tools that were free. So as you can see, like my mind is always working. Like what we've spoken, we spoke off camera, like what I've been doing today, been doing analysis all day. Um, I did the highlights this morning for the game that we had, which would be Wednesday night, which would be the free to win over Ebb Fleet was at Ebb Fleet. Um, learned things like streaming as well. I've learned how to do like, obviously you're doing this now, but like I've learned how to live stream a game like all off my own back. So you're talking about how did it start? But like it started from an acorn, like from just picking up a camera, talking to people, um, putting things out on social media I do for free. And eventually the job found me. I love that. Absolutely love that. And, and again, you know, it, it kind of just proves that if you're willing to work hard, um, be consistent, be be disciplined, anything can, can happen. Um, I wouldn't say I'm disciplined at all, by the way. I would say I'm undisciplined. But I, what I say to anyone, and I say this, like obviously we met in, we've met a few times, but we obviously met during the summer when I was doing um, packages for people who have got cup finals, which obviously is now coming to that point again, where if you've got a cup final, I think it works out. Someone spoke to the other, the other day, you know, I can obviously speak about money openly, but it's like £150, but you, obviously it's like a tenner a player and you get filming, photos, all that. But like, I always say to people, if I don't know something, I'll happily just go learn it. Like, it, again, it does probably say that like, I do put in the work, but I'm, if you, if you're, um, I heard this the other day, because I've got, I've got, like, I have got a form of ADHD as well. Like, but if you're interested in something, you will go learn it. Like, you, and I, I can guarantee you, I won't be the best at it at the start, but I'll get to a point where it's a high standard. Like, and again, during the summer, I did all those videos. I probably had an idea in my head and then they come out really well. Like the, the charcoal vets one that obviously I met you at on the day. If you watch that video back, there's the guy in the changing room. I just thought I put a GoPro up in the changing room. I got him dancing in his underwear and it, and people loved it. Like, and that's the sort of things you want to see, especially with like cup finals and that. It's a, it's a day and that memory will always be there. So yeah, look, I work hard. Uh, I wouldn't say I work hard. I would say that I'm probably not disciplined, but I am. I'm always trying to perfect perfect the little craft that I've got. And then again, like I speak to, uh, uh, I work with Ollie Groom. He's had ten years at Charlton. Some of the things I've shown him, he didn't know. But then I learned so much of him. Every time I'm with him, like we we obviously go to away games in the car together and stuff. I'm always learning. I'm always picking up little things of him or little snippets. So. Again, if I give advice to, uh, to anyone, when when you're with someone who's maybe a little bit higher or or someone that you just think has it, just pick up the snippets. Pick up the one percent. I would love to get your opinion about VOs versus DSLR cameras. It, I, cause the thing is, I don't film on a DSLR. I film on a... I think it's actually in the car, so I can't even get it out. But yeah. I film on a Sony AX something. Mm -hmm. But it's it's probably the equivalent to it, but it's um it was rated the best budget camera for sports filming. Now I didn't know that when I bought a capture mask. But um obviously I've had a VO and look like for for your for your for your scaffold clubs, maybe some of your Ishman clubs, it's a good little tool. It's a good little tool to have because not everyone can afford to have what 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 we bring yeah so your sunday league you know your sunday league clubs obviously not at south ballers but we obviously do we do the same stuff at when that we do at south ballers um but I, I would say it's more a coaching tool than anything but anything that brings you anything that brings you closer to being able to put footage out it's fantastic. Remember, like I, I know me and you are quite older gentlemen. Like, <laughs> when I played, when when I was able to play football at my, I would say my peak, there was no such thing as filming. No such thing. I think maybe the rarity there would be a guy filming, and photos. So like we're living in a world now, where like a VO, it isn't great. I I would say stay clear of it. There's better options out there. If you can get someone to do it with a DSLR camera or the Sony cameras, um, go for it. Like you pay, you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. 
But if you can get a VO and start and start at a VO, or there's you know obviously there's picks a lot, there's picks for teams, which is what I would say go for picks for teams. You can buy the Sony camera and put it on top, and it gives you the 180 view as well. And there's no subscription, and I think they use it at AFC Wimbledon um, for theirs. But you know, look, I, I don't rate VO highly, but if you've got it, there's no point in not using it. I know some people that have got it as well, and they go, oh, we only film this and that, and I'm thinking, still, in if you can get footage out there, get it out there. Yeah. Whether you use your phone, whether you use the SLR, Sony cameras, VO, any exposure you can get out there is good. But when the time comes to make the improvement, or you can get somebody somebody in like like what we have, or like yourself, Pay those extra, you know, all that roots. Pay the extra money. Pay, pay that, pay that little bit of love and care, and I guarantee you'll see better results from it. How important is it for you to make sure that you're paid what you're worth? And also, do you have any tips out there to kind of anyone else um, that, that that films, you know, foot, football events, football matches, to actually know exactly what to charge um, and I like, you know, also to respect what they do for other people. Yeah. Um, again, this is probably where, you know, like we're saying, like uh, I'm, I'm probably different to everyone. Um, there, I, I was speaking to someone really recently um, who's just started doing well in women. And she does it for free. And she was asking me like, what I charge. And I said, what you have to take in account though is what people see is people see you come in there doing a little bit of photos, doing a little bit of filming. And then they think you go home and the magic happens. The hardest part of photography filming is not the filming. It is the editing. It is the going home, uploading everything onto a Dropbox or a Google Drive or, a, or, or whatever you use and doing the editing and that is the most time consuming part because once you're there and it's happening you have to capture it live you have to be the one following but you have to obviously have your eye for it now like you're saying about people who charge and stuff like i said to this person what's your time worth now they turned around and said their time was worth 100 pounds i said okay but just be aware that the level that you're at no one charges 100 pound so you you think you're worth hundred pound? Cool. Tell people you are, tell people you want hundred pound. But then remember that people sort of have a level. So obviously, I'm in South East London. Photographers cost anywhere between for a Sunday league anywhere between forty to about sixty pound, depending on the photographer and their travel. Now I'm I'm obviously in that bracket. Um, I'm not I'm not forty pound. I'm I'm not sixty pound. I'm probably not fifty pound, depending on where it is, time and effort. And all that kind of stuff. And again, I'm different, but you say it like it's important to be paid, yes, but also as well, remember that sometimes the reasons that you do it for. So if let's just go backwards a little bit. If Tim if Tim messages me from Metrogas and says, Brownie, Metrogas are in a cup final, XYZ, XYZ, how much? And I'd say, Tim, uh, this is my normal rate. But because it's you, I'll take it down because it, oh, because it's Tim, because it's Metro Gas. Now, like if it's like, um, I work, obviously I work for Welling. Um, if it's someone at Welling and I get along with them really, really well, things like giving people the time, the effort, some people just go and go, this is my one rate. Now I'm different because I just want to, look, I want to try and get everyone the exposure, give everyone the time. But like we were saying earlier as well, people are in like cup finals now. So I think I'm not going to, I'm not trying to knock them. Your instant replay. Really good company. They do West Ham. They do, they're really high up. They do a lot of the teams in the Ishman. I think they're 150 to 190 a game. Now that's just filming and that's one camera going up, maybe a little bit extra. I, I tell people this, I'll tell you this for free. If you book me for a cup final, you'll get your footage, you'll get photos, you'll get 
a camera following you throughout the events. So obviously, as I'm taking photos, I also have another camera that if I see something happening, I can either strap it to my main camera or I can just film it there and then. You get GoPros in a goal. You get, if you'd like to, um, we can do a live stream for you. So you can send it to anyone who can't make the game or anything like that. Like that's a that's a standard. Now you get all that for like 150 quid. So you're talking about people getting paid and stuff. What's your worth? I also think that as well, you say, oh, like I'm, I'm probably high end. I don't think I am. I still think I'm learning. And I, I rate myself at 150 pounds, but you have to rate yourself on, on where you are on the guideline and where you think your worth is. So that person that turned around to me and said, oh, my photography's worth 100 pound. That's, that's good. You think that. And I think if I had 100 pound, would I give it to you? Yeah. But I also know, I also know that no one else is that expensive. So to, to obviously like roll it back in, how important is it to get paid? Yes, it's important to get paid. Um, equipment, equipment costs money. Do I want to get paid? Yeah. Sometimes I just want to get my petrol and I just want to do people favors. But it's important that you know your worth and you're not breaking your back to do it neither. So you've mentioned about coaching and this slides nicely into South Ballers. How did, how did that um, project start? That's a bit of a mad one. So I was in the women's game. Um, I went from Charlton and under 21 women. I followed Cole to Stevenage. And then Stevenage was a bit, a bit long-winded. There was no money in it neither. So we were talking about knowing your worth. Me and Carl were travelling to Stevenage three times a week. That's far. So I live in, let's just say I live near Blue Water, right? Mm. And there to Stevenage is an hour and a half each way. Wow. Three times a week. Yes, me and Carl are like car sharing. So obviously we're splitting the petrol. But that's a lot of petrol and a lot of effort. And almost nothing really to be a, a women's first team where it didn't work out. And then I was really lucky at the time. Connor Diamond, he's diamond by nature as well. Um, runs Dartford Women. Uh, I asked if I could go down. Went in as a coach there. Really big contrast as well, because like how Carl is to how Connor is, it's like two flip sides of the coin. Um, had a fantastic time at Dartford, and I think at Christmas, uh, Christmas slash January, it didn't. Again, uh, Connor, Connor got one of his coaches back and, you know, one thing led to another and I didn't, I didn't feel like I was in the right situation. So we parted ways. I'm still really good friends with Connor. Again, Connor is probably one of the nicest people I've ever met in football. Um, and his missus, Jade, they still, you know, they're still at Dartford and they're still doing well. And I always look out for Dartford women. Went somewhere else. I hated it. Like, and when I say I hated it, like the coach was terrible. He was doing things like, in the warm up, he was giving him a full coaching drill. I didn't like the way he run things. And then I waited, I, I bided my time. I, I let things go, I let things go. And then he let me, he gave me a little bit of the reins. And when I say like, he treated it like, you remember old school Sunday league? Like you just throw the bag down and mm. walk out. Mm. And, you know, there'd be nothing set up for you. Yeah. That's how he treated it. And if, or if he did, He'd make you do a full session for a game. And I remember my first ever game was against Dartford Women and we got bopped. When I say bops, like I was sitting on the sideline and just like, I don't want to be here. Like, I just want to like, hide my face. Second game was against Dartford at Dartford. And I made the change. I said, look, look, can I just take over next week? Can I just do the things that I think are right? So got there early, set up the changing room for them. Um, set up a warm-up so they came out to a warm-up mm. that's how i knew from that moment before we get to that was i knew i had high standards the people that i've worked with even going back to metro gas with like mike and people like that i knew that they, they they've given me high standards like i don't care if the thing i went was like near the bottom of the league and i wanted to give those women the high standards we didn't win we didn't get bopped though at dartford I remember that. I remember going out, giving the session that I thought was good, the, the correct warm up in my eyes. And then um, 
just things didn't work out at the club. It all came down to the manager just didn't like it. And the whim, and the uh, a fair few of the women started saying that they would have preferred me to have been in charge and things like that. And yeah, I, I eventually just left. And South Ballers was just something that was going on on the side. So the, they were doing, they were taking filming off us and um, they were looking for players. And I could, I, at the time, I still could play. So I went down for a couple of sessions, kept quiet, kept my head down. And um, they was like, yeah, do you want to play? I was like, yeah, fantastic. Kept really quiet. And then the manager, I think it was an old guy. He wanted to play four, basic Mike Bassett, four four two, back of a fag packet, you know, run your ass off. Da, 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 da. Mm. I didn't play. Uh, I didn't sign because I was still doing, you know, um, some photography on a Sunday and stuff for a little while. Uh, I said, oh, I'll play. I'll play in a couple of weeks. And then I went I went down on a Sunday and they lost 10-2 or something like that. But I remember going. It was at Greenwich University. And I came just towards the end of the game. And people were arguing with each other and everything. And um, I just kept really quiet. And the managers walked off and they were still arguing. So I spoke to the guy, Ruin, who owns South Ballers, lives in France lovely guy and I said look um, I can coach I don't know if I can coach well I said I've never I've never I've been a manager once I've been a manager of Irith and Belvedere Reserves and I took them from like getting getting whacked every week to just being at a good level and a good standard and my friend Harry Lockie took them over and they just kept going um, but I said look I've, I'm, I'm willing to come in and just and just try for you man like don't let your boys don't let your boys down I think I did. I think I went in that Thursday. I did a session that I thought was going to be capable of just defending. And I think I put a tweet out a couple of weeks ago about when you go into a club and it's not working or if it isn't working for you, do you have to look at your players and say, you can't play my system, so I have to play with the players I have? Or do you just keep implementing your system? Now, at South Ballers, when I first got there, my first thing was, I can't play the system I want to play. I looked at my players and went, I can't play what I want to play. I want to try and play football that is good. Like, it can be exciting, or can we just play, you know, to feet? I knew that wasn't going to happen. So I instantly went in and said, Look, I'm just going to teach you the basics of defending. I want us to be hard to beat. I want us to to be in games because I think before I went there as well, they had a. I think the record is if you look at it as well, is they went ten games without a win. Mm. Now like, I ain't saying I went and won all my games or anything like that. God, like last year towards the end of the year was hard, but won the first friendly, second game, the, the official first game against Peckham Rye, only lost two 0 We missed a penalty and a couple of other chances. I just got them competitive and I got them, I, I, I did win like three or four games and, um, but the, the score line, I never lost by more than two goals. So towards the end of the year, South Ballers were, as Selk would say, is South average and they were, <laughs> but like, that's, that's the right tag to give them. Um, but the boys have all like, they bought into the project. Then the summer came around, there was an overhaul, some players, wanted to move on. I think only four or five players from the original South Ballers when I got there stayed. But we had a really good summer, really good overhaul. Um, all the players that have come in, like, all into what we were doing. And again, I treat I treat the South Ballers players exactly how they would be treated. You know, well, like mine before standard would be Cray Valley or how we was treating the players at Charlton or Dartford. And now, obviously, I treat my boys like how to get treated at Welling. High standards, make sure things are done. Like, so, yeah, how, how, how I've got to South Ballers. And this year, we've been competitive. And I think, obviously, I listened to Selk. We went on a game of like a run of like nine unbeaten until really recently where we lost to Bexley, who were second. And then the next game, we lost to Danson, who were top. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't think like to go in and win the league to be competitive and to make sure that progression happens too many times people get 
hyped up on winning games. Like when we were winning all these games, the guy who owns South Ball was like, no, I'm beaten, this and that. And I was, my, my hands were in my head like, I don't want to speak about it. Uh, I don't. I don't want to speak about nine unbeaten. I just want to speak about the next game, and we um, we done something really good. A couple, you know, a couple of Wednesday Wednesdays ago at Thamesmead, you know, we'd put a game on for Westfar in a midweek game. I would say thirty to thirty to maybe forty five, fifty people showed up, and a lot of my boys will never get that opportunity to play in the stadium. They'll never get to play under the lights. Um. And obviously, we do all the, we do all the things at South Ballers. You know, we, we record the games, we put the footage out. You know, I don't do the editing at South Ballers, thank God, because that would just be too much for me. Like Ruin does all that. We just give him the footage. But like to think about where we was when I first got there, and we were training on like a sand astro as well. We now train at the same place where, well, we trained there before Welling United did, but like we train at the same place where United train. Um, and just to think like where the club's gone and where the club is now, we've got really good players in there. We've got, you know, um, I was like three or four, uh, three of my boys have all had a trial at high end clubs. Um, two of them got to play in a game for Welling. And then a lot of them now are going to play Kent standard football, but they never thought they could. So I'm, I'm pleased in my coaching journey as well that I've got players that have like come from here to d- up here or players that are up here. And we've all met in the middle and we've got all good standards. Like, but yeah, the journey, the, how I've got into South Ballers was a madness. Um, and the journey we've had so far has been brilliant. I've always wanted to be competitive with them. So if we finish in third, fourth, second, first, fantastic. But, um, to know that last year, you know, when I came in, steadied the ship, uh, massive, massive shout out to Gibbs as well who's Peckham Ryan's manager, he always said that I'll get it right. Um, I don't think I've got it right, but I feel like I've, I'm getting it right. And and we run things like, we run things like it's a pro club, man. Like, I make sure I get down there. And we get down there about 8.30 on a Sunday, set up the change of room, home or away. And then whilst the boys are getting changed, we set up the warm up, set up all the cameras. So yeah, South Ballers is something that just take just take it professionally, no matter what standards we're at, whether it's Sunday League, Premier League, Championship, no matter where you are, I treat everything as if it's Champions League. Mm. Love that. And and uh, I just want to say that South Ballers, again, um, I think the first time I noticed, noticed South Ballers was when, I don't know who, who kind of controls your social media, but um, they kept on tagging me in on Twitter. I kept tagging me in. I was like, okay, like, you know. I told them to do that. I, honestly, like, but, <laughs> but, you see, but you see, like, it worked. You know, you know, I, you know, um, I was kind of noticing every time. I'm like, you know, I've got to check out this, this, this kind of um team, and um, and uh, I think what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna kind of do like something because again, like, you guys are relentless. Like, keep tagging me in, and and it works. You know, every time I get a notification, it's South Ballers all the time. So. Again, that's an, like, another tip out there. If you're if you're kind of consistent and motivated, then literally, if you want someone to actually watch a highlight or watch something, just keep tagging them in because trust me, they will see it. Um, Eventually, I think that was another thing that we did when we settled in the summer was we had a big overhaul in the summer, and I was like, we need to tag people like like yourself in, like Roots, um, you know, like your fresh, like Selk, people that that can that already have those little bit of influences so that, you know, they might not, the first 10 times you tag them, they might not take interest. So thank you for taking that little bit of interest. Yeah, it does work. Trust me, it does work. Um, who's the one player um, in your team that's not reaching their potential and why? Oh, I really think uh, not reaching their potential. Wow. Uh, I've got to say Noah. There's a player called Noah. Absolutely lovely guy built built so well as well but like, he can win the ball he can run around people but he just sometimes doesn't reach that but like he'll pick the ball up and then try and go around about four players i don't get it like he's built like thomas party mm. like he's got good feet he can do those things can't head up all for his to save it or he can now but couldn't head up all to save his life at the beginning 
but like he's just it just doesn't click sometimes for him and he has games where he's okay but like i always think like i just need to keep selecting him need to keep selecting him and i think like he has so much potential to be that 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 dynamo midfielder that's got everything but it just yeah just doesn't he just he's just not reaching it but like again that's me as a coach how do i how do i solve that problem because for him i know he's got the tools so how do i solve that problem for him What's the one tip that you would give to any football coach looking to go into the pro game? Into the pro game? Uh, I'm not even in the pro game. Uh, what? No, but, uh, yeah, what? You know what? Stop being modest. Like you've you you've literally been around pro players. Like you've you've literally been I, around. I, I am now. Yeah, like, I do. I get I get that. Whether United, I get to I get to work with Warren, who's been an you know a Northern Ireland international. He's played against Messi and Ronaldo. Um, and I, I'm like a sponge with these people, but I think the one thing that if you're going to give any coach any advice, I don't know if anyone's ever told you this year, but all the best coaches are thieves. And also as well in football, it's, it's a lot of, it sounds really bad. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Like we're me and you and everyone else that comes on here are grassroots people. So we, we connect. Yeah, we make we make those make those things. But when you get into to the the higher ends and the higher reaches of football, you've got to you've got to be able to sit with the big people and make friends with them. And I think that's if I can give any advice to anyone is watch everything, write it down because I write down everything that I, I write down every session that we do. Um, I've been doing that ever since Metro Gas days. I write down every single session that happens and then learn. And then when you, when you meet someone, when you make a contact, make sure you save their number, make sure you touch in with them, make sure you make sure that you always, always treat them with respect. So I, I, I'm, I, I, I'm not in the program but I'd love to obviously be there one day, but like I get to, I get to work with some amazing people. I get to work with Warren. I get to work with, with Ollie groom who a lot of Charlton fans, you know, would have loved to have spoken to when he left, the, when he left Charlton. I get to work with uh, Keith Bonas, the Wellings women manager. Sometimes I get to pick his brain and he's been quite high. You know, I get to, to work with some amazing individuals uh, the only advice I would give is just keep learning from those people and keep meeting those people. When someone gives you an opportunity to go and meet them, get in the car. And that's one thing as well that, you know, like I've said, like I've done a lot of work for free and you're going, we'll go backwards now to the thing about your time and your effort and stuff. Your effort has to be, if someone says to you, you can go and meet whoever, go and meet them. Cause you don't know, you don't know what they're going to offer you. You don't know, but I, I obviously I went on my next level of coaching. Keith Bonas just said, "Look, got an opportunity at Welling. Do you want to go and do you want to go and take it?" Uh, Cray Valley, you know, I put out that I wanted to do some free work with some people. Ended up with Joe Doherty. Somehow ended up at Cray Valley. Too many people. Sometimes, you know, you know advice wise, see the money first. Uh, for me, it was just an experience. It was a, just a chance to learn. And if people were watching you, everyone is watching as well. Everyone is watching. No matter what you do, you're getting watched. Go and go and be, go and be a Swiss Army knife. Do you know what? That's 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 the biggest. That's, forget everything I just said. Forget it. <laughs> be a Swiss Army knife. Be a Swiss Army knife. So I can tell you now, being a Swiss Army knife will get you everywhere. Now, like. I get to do I get to do analysis at Welling. I never thought in a million years that I'd, I'd I'd go and do analysis or I'd go and have to try and pick it up. I know people that do it, and now I'm picking up advice from them. But again, just just make sure that when you're meeting people, you remember them, you make good impressions with them, and if if they want you to do something, go and learn it. Don't say I don't know. Don't ever tell someone you don't know nothing. Say okay. I'm I'm not quite familiar with it, but I'll learn. But be a Swiss be, be a Swiss Army knife. That's it. Be a Swiss Army knife. Love that. 
Sunday League football versus YouTube football. What is your opinion about both communities, both industries? Are they are they not one community though? What would you what would you class a YouTube team as? So let me ask you that question. What would you class a YouTube team as? Well, would you say you, hashtag United are a, a YouTube team? I would say hashtag United are a YouTube team because um, you know they they are very competitive in in their league. But there are some teams that only play other YouTube teams. There's like leagues that is. I say so we're like, going back to the whole like summer where the YouTube league came in and. Yeah, it's sorry. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't even so, say it was you. Does every does every? I don't follow that. So does every team in that league do YouTube? Every team that I know of at that time had a YouTube. Okay, team. so obviously I know that I know Sean from the Wall. Uh, I know I know I know Essie Don's really. You know, I've got to again. I've got to work with uh, because of Joe. I got to work with like people like Big G and stuff. Um, but they still they still started in the park. Like they still started on on places like Martin and playing fields. They still started just a bunch of guys wanting to play Sunday league football. Who who are we as people to have a go at them for wanting to reach the next stage and and say to them, Oh, you can't go make a YouTube league? Who are we to say that? You can't you can't say that to anyone. Like there's no comparison to it because now they're out of there, now they're you know, like now FC Dons are out of the Bromley League. Is the Bromley League more is the Bromley League more competitive? Yeah, because people wanted to go into the Bromley League to, to play the Dons, and then when the Dons left, it's still competitive because the, all the best players still wanted to play in those leagues. Westfar, you know, UTR were absolutely smashing it. Right. Like, don't tell me that because of UTR have gone that Westfar's gone down. Westfar's gone up. Like and it it also gives a platform for someone else to be the next UTR, the next SC Dons. Like I'm not saying that's what South Ballers want to be. That, that's 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 not that's not my like, that, you know I don't play that vision. That's that's Ruins' vision if he wants to do that. But where I stand in between it is they're all the same. They're all still playing on a Sunday. Whether you want to call it, whether you want to call it YouTube League or you want to call it Sunday League, it's still Sunday. It's still Sunday football. I think people get really like uppity about it, but it's just the it's just the prime of Sunday League football. It's the crop. It's the best. The best be the best. It's the it's the official Super League of Sunday League, isn't it? Also, as well, them teams playing each other means that the other leagues become more competitive because when Westfro um, UTR were in Westfar, sorry, UTR were, were slapping everyone, and some people are like, oh, there's no point. So. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I guess in the Alperton of Bromley, the SE Dons lost more games, but you know the wall. The wall again. I know Sean really well. Again, I got to work with her, and she's a great individual. She's a really great person. Right, uh, I know that they, you know, they they had to go with their up and downs. So to have a go at them for saying, "Oh, like YouTube football," they're creating something next level, and they're creating pathways for people who want to be those sort of, people, sort of teams. They're inspiring the next, the next level of YouTube, aren't they? So there's no there's no comparison between the two. It's all Sunday League, but it's just people that are that are smart enough to go and make something out of it. Michael, thank you so much for like coming on, and 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 also as well, I just want to um, pull it on camera. Um, we were literally at the Charcoal West Fulham final. And and Michael kindly gave me his footage um, for me to blend into like my footage as well. So honestly, Michael, thank you, thank you so much for that. Oh, that's fine. Like, if anyone ever meets me, that ever ever meets me at a game or something, um, I do it a lot of well in. Like I just say, look, as long as we're in the same league, I don't mind giving people footage and stuff. It's not a problem. But the only problem I will say is with um, South Ball is if we don't release the footage to other clubs until after the video goes out. That's just something we do now. But yeah, if, if, if another photographer or someone like yourself is doing a vlog or something, I'll happily offer them the footage. It's not a problem because we're all in the same world. So we've got to help each other. <laughs>